Hello, Healthcare Experience Matters podcast listeners. We have a new guest on our show today. Her name is Dr. Natasha Beauvais. She's a physician at Northern Virginia Family Practice Associates. It's a family medicine practice that offers full service concierge healthcare, and it's located in the Northern Virginia region. So I want to jump into this discussion first and foremost by having Dr. Beauvais just introduce herself to our listeners and tell us a little bit about her professional background and also the full service concierge health care work that she's involved with. Sure, Casey. It's, it's great to meet you today. I didn't realize we're almost neighbors um, with you being in Baltimore and we're here in D.C., um, so yeah, my name is Natasha Beauvais. Uh, I've been a physician for about 20 years and have spent maybe the last 15 years working here uh, at Northern Virginia Family Practice. I've, I've also spent several years working in downtown DC for Unity Healthcare, which is a public health service organization. Um, I have four kids. Uh, I I love to try to find the balance in work and seeing the kids because that's a constant, um, it's kind of constant excitement on, on, on all sides of doing everything. <laughs> so, um, so concierge medicine is something that um, I did not go into willingly. Uh, I had joined this private practice after working in public health for for four, four years. And initially I was the traditional medicine physician working with three other physician assistants who had been in the practice for a long time. And the, the owners of the practice, the other, the, uh, the older doctors had gone into concierge medicine and they wanted to keep the traditional side of their practice open. So they asked me to become the traditional doctor, which I did loved it for seven years. Um, I think part of why I loved it was because I was only part-time. And at that time I was still having babies. My children were young. I was dying to get home by 3.30 every day to see my kids after school. Um, I had a babysitter for the babies uh, that were still in the home. Um, and I think part of why I did not get totally swallowed practicing medicine was because I was part-time. Um, and then when I was asked to take over my boss's practice when he wanted to retire, I was pretty cautious about that. Um, I, was, I was uncomfortable with the idea of charging an annual fee. I was very happy with my medical practice. I liked the, I liked the way it was going as it was. Um, but I also really loved where I was working. I think the culture was healthy. The, the, Physician assistants I worked with every day were excellent, um, and I and, and and the medicine was good. Like I had come from public health, and and then coming into private medicine is a very different level of communication between physicians and their consultants. And I just couldn't believe the support I was getting from consultants and the the education I was getting from working with them. And I did not want to leave either the environment of healthy culture or the high quality medicine that was already happening. Um, so I agreed to take over his practice. And then I was kind of opened up to another world of another, another facet of quality and culture in, in, in the healthcare services world that um, I'm really glad he worked me really hard so that uh, I said, yes. <clears throat> Well, I want to talk today about how physicians can mitigate burnout, and we're going to talk about how that can be done by maintaining a positive practice culture. So let's jump into it here. What are some of the biggest challenges about your job? And if there's anything that listeners who are experiencing similar challenges might be able to learn from you? Sure. Um where to start, um, you know, I think burnout or other words for that, you know, to kind of start slowly exhaustion or, 
um, or just the normalcy of overwork. Um, it is a constant aspect of healthcare on all sides, not, not just the doctors, but nurses, administrators, physicians, mid-level providers. I think in healthcare, we have a culture of it being normal to be kind of running as fast as we can. And it's not really healthy for patients. It's not really healthy for those nurses that are working extra shifts. It's not really healthy for the physicians who are working nights and weekends to finish their charts. And, and, and that's almost everyone in healthcare. Um, so to underscore what, you know, what your podcast is about, you're saying this is about mitigating burnout and a positive practice culture. You know, I think we could spend our lives working on that subject. Yeah, definitely. And in your opinion, what kind of goes into building that positive practice culture? Well, it's something that um, in my mind starts with really, really basic fundamentals of human relationship. And it's not, it's not cheerleady and, and um, kind of false energy. It's, it's really hearing people and really not just listening, but then working on creative, creating a structure of skill building so that all of us, starting with me, uh, but including everyone, not only the physicians, not only the providers, but every administrator, every nurse, every biller, every physician can then slowly develop a true sense of trust with each other and can build skills to make it feel safer to have honest conversations between peers. And I just, I'm curious before we keep moving along here, what was your original reason for going into the met, going into the field of medicine in the first place? Did you look at it as kind of a calling like so many people do or what, what fueled your passion originally for this? I think that's a good, good question and I'll answer it, but I also just think it's so important for all of the people in our offices because every single one of the people here has a reason why that's really important to them. Whether that's the person who's first interacting with the patient on the phone or the person that's last interacting with the patient you know, on a, a follow-up phone call or handling money or handling you know, lab, lab appointments and refills. All of those people are here because they have a really personal drive something really important happened in their life somewhere that makes them either incredibly empathetic or incredibly aware of how how critically healthcare influences the, the essential aspects of people's lives um, so to go back to my answer i i remember uh sitting in a car with my mom when i was about 11 and watching a very elderly person get out of a car and be helped somewhere. And I, you know, kind of quietly and cautiously confided in my mom that I really wanted to help old people. Um, and I don't know why that was my drive when I was 11 years old, um, but I think I just felt a nat natural sensitivity and drive to that vulnerability. That is a great story. And I'm glad I asked the question because that, that really helps with the discussion and, and, and establishes why you went, to med went into medicine in the first place. Have you had a personal journey with exhaustion or burnout that might be helpful for us to discuss on this show that listeners might be able to learn about? I had the lucky um, 
unexpected event of having my first child in residency and uh, my second child the month after I graduated from residency. And so even during residency, when I was actually quite torn about whether I should finish my training at all, because I wanted so much to be present to that baby, um, I had the, the pull of children kind of pulling some balance into my life. Um, and because I have a partner who is gainfully employed, I did not have to go to work full time as soon as I got out of residency. And so I had the benefit of a gradual entrance into the workforce, you know, 50, actually, when I first started working after the, the kids were born, I was only working two half days a week. And then, you know, very quickly that became 50% and then it became 60%, but it stayed at 50 or 60% for about 10 years while I had kids. And so I think that well, I can tell you that story of how, how demanding that is. And I really know what that is to not be able to finish charts and never be finished with patients and always feel rushed and never have enough time to call people back. The, the thing that mitigated that for me working in traditional medicine was that I was only working part-time. And so if I was staying late, you know, an extra two or three hours to catch up on charts or catch up on phone calls, it was only bringing me up to that 40 hours a week. It wasn't bringing me from like 40 to 60 hours a week or 80 in some cases. And so um, I, I think I definitely know what that pace feels like, but I, I, hadn't, I didn't have to carry that after residency on a full-time level. Um, one of the doctors I work with very closely was as soon as she graduated from residency, she was getting to her primary care job at six o'clock in the morning every day. And not leaving until 6 p.m. But she was only seeing patients between eight and four. So she needed four, yeah, I guess that's four extra hours every single day to be practicing the kind of quality medicine, doing the follow-up on time, organizing her labs ahead of time, getting people's communications and refills done. That's the kind of time commitment she was doing on a full-time basis. And I'm sure I was doing my version of that part-time. And it sounds like family life and having a great support system and partner is a big part of how you were able to mitigate burnout. Any other words of encouragement for those that have children and are trying to balance the demands of being a parent and a, what they hope is a, you know, abundant and productive career? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't even know if that's a, that's the right question to ask, because it's like so much to ask of anybody to say, like, you know, how does, how to, how the, does that specific support um, make things possible, because it, it doesn't really answer the question of like, it should be possible without necessarily that support, like we should be able to, to find a way to make healthcare better so that the balance doesn't fall on our ability to spend an extra 50% of the time that we're at work in addition to that to get everything done. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I have a best friend who's also my partner and that really works for us. And, and I also have a two income household and not everyone can say that. So I, I think, I think that as the answer is not really a good answer because it really just doesn't work for everybody. Um, and, and single people as well as partnered people need to have the same work-life balance. Um, you know, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to have a spouse that's covering the finances so we don't have to work full, full time so that we can then work part-time and still see yeah. our children and pay for health care and pay for child care and still get our charts done, you know, which, which pretty much every physician is, is working an extremely demanding life on top of their actual work hours. And it's, it, it's that that causes exhaustion. Um, 
and and so how do we work to fix that <laughs> it is 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 an impossible thing to answer in an hour um but even just being willing to kind of train ourselves to be honest about how 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 that feels and whether or not we can sustain that and whether or not that's healthy whether or not we're really able to put our mental focus on what is happening with patients if we feel rushed or if we feel like we just forgot that thing for the last patient. So we're kind of still thinking about that thing for the last patient because they got scooched out the door because we were already 20 minutes late. I think there is no easy answer to that, e even the way that I'm doing medicine. Yeah. But, um, but the way that, I think the way that we're doing medicine does afford us some time to be able to realize you know, not just that we have to change a system or two, but that we we have to learn how to communicate with each other in a way that we don't come into the, to the office or to our professional lives with this skill. So if we as a as a company are not offering skill building and really working to create a, a place where it's safe enough to build skills because in order to be building skills, we have to be admitting that we don't have the skill. Mm. Um, you know, and that again, starts with me, you know, so I have to be willing to say, you know, I don't really know how to order this new medicine for, for COVID. And so I can talk to my partners about it. But if I wasn't comfortable enough asking about that, the first week that I had that question, then I become embarrassed six months down the line that I still don't know that answer. And I'm too uncomfortable not knowing the answer that I, that I don't expose my own lack of knowledge or my own vulnerability and my own um, incompetence. But mm -hmm. if I'm, I'm comfortable enough being honest to say, I don't know this and I'm a little embarrassed about not knowing it, but, but could you help me find that? answer and if i can be comfortable enough about that then i can be a better doctor even if i don't know all the answers um, and my staff can be better at working with each other and solving problems and calling patients back because they can work to have each other's backs it's great these are these are really important points and i'm glad you're bringing them up on today's discussion here on healthcare experience matters do you have any other thoughts on culture's role in all of this and how building that right culture can help mitigate some of these effects of burnout. Sure. Well, I mean, culture from the beginning is what keeps us where we are, what keeps us in healthcare if if we really do like the culture of it. I mean, I guess maybe in a more fundamental level, we have a desire to help and to interact with patients at these critical points in their lives. Um, and I, I wouldn't have continued with this job when I took it 15 years ago, if the culture weren't already pretty good. Like I felt very well supported and I felt very grateful to, to have the colleagues that I had that were really working in a great a great traditional medicine practice already. The physician assistants were really thoughtful, really intellectually curious, really working to get the right answer. Um, and, you know, even within a good environment, uh, you know, now we've switched to concierge medicine, we have more time, we are less pressured, we can communicate within our office more than than we did before, um, but we still don't have it all right, right? So we still have to keep working on that culture. And I think um, people, I mean, speaking just from, from our little small office, people that are here are here for a reason. And I think they're examples of, of why people are in healthcare throughout the whole world. That, that, that they have a gift to offer, they have a natural empathy, they have a care for others and a desire to, to be helpful. Um, 
but if we don't work on our desire to, or maybe if we don't cultivate our desire to, to first care for one another within the office, then we, we, what we have is a strength maybe native to us or maybe you know, natural inclinations to be helpful and thoughtful gets kind of worn away or chipped away at over time. And so I think the, the best healthcare starts with an environment that can be really, really caring within the work environment first. So how do we learn to really listen to what's going on for people and really create an honest conversation about that with, with people? And then take people wherever they're at and create something that feels like they can be themselves when they are here. And that we, we not just we like the management, but we, every person here is really caring for, for the other people here. I mean, I've had um, two really impactful events personally in my personal family life. And in one instance, I had to leave the office and live in another state for several months. And the amount of concern that I was, that I received and the amount of support that my coworkers gave me when I needed to do something different was just tremendously affirming that like we can really be there for each other. And, and that's, that's, you know, my nurse and my receptionist and my coworkers pitching in and like seeing patients for me and communicating and talking to them. And um, so I couldn't do this work if it weren't that I had that kind of collaboration and that I, I'm willing to provide that kind of collaboration when someone else has a need. Because one of the biggest things that's going on in all of our lives is that we have massively important things happening outside of the office. Um, but we don't all have a chance to bring that into the office and say, I'm really in need. So instead we have to cover it up and work around it and not sleep all night while we're taking care of our kids and you know just pretend that everything is fine but but in fact everything isn't fine for everybody and they still come to work and they still really want to be here and they still want to do a good job and they still need what they need for for whoever is in need in their own homes um, it's so interesting when we look at the like the physician moms facebook group there's a huge Facebook group that's all physician women. And what do we post on there? We post about needs of our immediate family members and who can help. Like we are carrying the needs of those people, our children, our parents, our cousins, whoever it is. And people have these really tough healthcare challenges. And how do I get the support I need for this? And so like, we're almost more willing to share that on Facebook in this particular private group, then we might be willing to share with our actual coworkers. Um, and that's, I think, an opportunity for us as an office to be able to make it feel safer to do that in person with, with each other. That's really interesting. Would you recommend other people might consider joining something like a private Facebook group to exchange ideas like that, who are maybe feeling the effects of burnout or overwhelmed at work? Sure. I mean, I think that's a, that's a resource. I mean, I think I'm, I'm kind of, I'm vouching for or encouraging something that goes much further than that. But, but I do think that it's, it's sometimes hard for people to be fully, truly honest at work for whatever, about whatever's happening for them. And so not unlike, you know, sometimes maybe if we're on a plane with someone or sitting on a, on a train, we may wind up with an earful of, you know, what's going on in a person's life because there's a certain safety in anonymity. 
and to, you know, so a person may open up and tell a big life story or a very significant event with, with a feeling of relative safety because we aren't going to see each other again. And there's this, and there's a, there's a, a willingness to share or a vulnerability, but it's not as hard as it would be to do that with your coworker who's going to see you every day. And so, um, you know, sometimes I get an eyeful if I look at those, those groups there, you know, there are people that are really, really struggling in medicine. And I mean, it is crazy what people post about what their needs are, but I'm not sure that really helps people get the support that they really need, which would be, you know, come much more slowly and much more gradually, but is going to be better if it's happening face to face with people that we really work with every day and we work to learn to trust every day. This has been great. We're joined today on Healthcare Experience Matters by Dr. Natasha Beauvais. And I'm just going to ask if she has any other final or closing thoughts she'd like to leave with us on today's subject, um, talking about mitigating burnout um, and, and the importance of company culture. Hmm. Well, I guess I can see that I haven't answered any of your um, I haven't provided any solutions. You know, I don't think that there is a, it, there's not like any, there's not an easy answer. And I think maybe what we're working, what we are working to do is to create a normalcy about working on that problem. You know, that it's like, it's not like we're gonna solve it by, you know, an extra voucher to go to the gym or something <laughs> where, you know, we are, we're going, to we're going to work together to toward a solution for problems by learning how to talk to each other learning how to be willing to share what's really happening very slowly in a you know, very gradually so that it actually can be real um, and it has to start with the leader themselves like it has to be you know it, it can't just be that we're, we're, we're shooting for something where suddenly, you know, Mary trusts Jane because that was an, that was a, an implemented regulation at work. You know, we have to really be willing to, to be open with each other. And, um, and, and I guess what changes when that starts is that people begin to see each other as, as human being to human being instead of Coworker to coworker, or you know, manager to to direct report, or whoever companies want to name those relationships, um, and and that's really really meaningful for the leader as well. It's not like you do it because it's going to change your efficiency. You do it because it's a better way to live. Well, I will let that be the final word. Our guest today has been Dr. Natasha Beauvais. She is a physician at Northern Virginia Family Practice Associates. That's a family medicine practice offering full service concierge health care in Northern Virginia. Thank you again, Dr. Beauvais, for your time today. Thanks, Casey. It's been great to talk to you.